Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> this is like the second time this has happened to me. Um, where I come from when good afternoon is a big deal. So good afternoon. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint. And I'm kind of glad that I don't have a PowerPoint because that would have been a very tough act to follow um, with the data visualization that happened in the previous presentation. So I'm just going to talk. And I'm going to invite you to think about a couple of things with me. Um, because I think that a lot of the tension that I have with this particular space or this particular topic is how much expert knowledge and how much people position themselves as experts kind of creates this discrepancy and people end up feeling disempowered, like they don't have anything to say or anything to add to the conversation. And we even heard in the previous presentation about how for some of these organizations, opacity, like hiding information, lack of transparency is part of creating the power as part of entrenching the power. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to have a, a, a almost like a, 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 what do they call it, a stream of consciousness conversation, where I'm going to present you with some of the ideas that I'm grappling with. And I'm going to invite you to think with me um, through these ideas. And hopefully, at the end of it, we can um, figure out where we are in the world with these issues and how we can uh, move forward together. Um, by way of background, as you heard, my name is Nanjala. Uh, born and raised in Nairobi, Kenya, um, fastest runners in the world, um, and not me, I don't even run for the bus, um, but I have been for the last five years, more or less, um, really 12 years if you think about it, but actively for the last five years, been thinking about the place of technology in politics, and particularly in my own country, Kenya. And the reason I picked Kenya is really not to do with myself being Kenyan, I mean, that's part of it, it helps. But it's because Kenya occupies this very weird space in the current technological landscape. When you, if we're talking about maps and map making, and if you made a map of how um, con the conversation of technology flows, the geographical places that it's tied to, you will probably look out on Africa and just kind of think, uh, what? Um, a lot of the time we think about that tech is a very Western-centered uh, conversation. Lately, we're thinking about China. Lately, we're thinking about um, less so Japan, um, to some extent Korea. But what we're missing in the process of these maps that we're making about where technology exists or where technology is done is that for the, be the bigger part of the world, this stuff is not a passive thing. Technology is not just something that lands on us and happens to us, but it's something that is actually being shaped by our participation and is being shaped by our agency and our histories and our political practices. So the reason why I wanted to study Kenya is Kenya has emerged from the digital landscape as kind of a weird outlier. We're not the most anything in Africa, except maybe the fastest. Take that, Ethiopia. Um, we are not the richest. We don't have the most oil. We don't have the most lithium. We don't have the most coal tan. We don't have the most people. We don't have the longest coastline. By any considerable metric, we are a decidedly average country. So how does a decidedly average country become the world leader in mobile money? How does a decidedly average country become the continental leader in social media participation? How does this decidedly average country start to be a, a, a center for the conversation on how technology is going to impact politics, not just in Africa, but around the world? These are the research questions that I've been grappling with for the last couple of years. I've been trying to think about how, why a British company would take $60,000 from a Kenyan presidential candidate to shape political opinion during a very hotly contested election. That's what happened last year. The current president of Kenya spent more money on British, uh, came from Cambridge Analytica than he did on his entire, the rest of his entire campaign. How does that then project and become the Brexit vote, Cambridge Analytica in the Brexit vote and Cambridge Analytica in the Trump vote? When I think about these issues, and this is kind of why I was excited to be part of this conversation, because this idea of cartographies and maps and map making stretches the research that I've been doing into a very new direction. It takes me into a place that um, I have to put myself back into the research. I'm a political scientist by training. Political scientists were expected to deal in abstraction, 
We're expected to come up with random theories about everything and about human behavior and history and all of that stuff. And putting yourself back into the research can be a very uncomfortable process. But I love inter interdisciplinarity and I love being in spaces like this because it encourages me to flip that process back on its head and put myself back in the research. And so the idea of cartography for me is when I put myself back into the conversation about Kenya, what does the landscape, about politics and technology in Kenya, what does the landscape look like? What is cartography and the idea of cartography and, and, and map making, what tools does it give me to process this research that I've been handling for the last five, 10 years? What new things does it throw up? One of the interesting things that it throws up for me is the place of the citizen in this landscape, right? So I've been dealing with theories and institutions, and I try to talk about agency in my book, and I try to talk about people, but it's still really hard for people to, to, for myself as a researcher, but also for other people, to really see where the human is in this conversation. And the concept of cartography to me allows me to connect myself, my present day self, and the digital to this genealogy of map making that goes back to colonization and goes back to pre-colonization. And I'm gonna walk you through what that experience has been like for me. This has been a very stretching experience because it's forced me to start to think differently about things that I thought I knew about myself and my place in my country. The three things that I picked out that I wanted to tease out, um, surveillance, data, data collection, and I wanted us to also think a little bit about the idea of, I'm gonna get my notes. <laughs> the idea of identity and identity systems. Because these are three spaces that I really wanted to explore in my research, but I couldn't find the right entry point until I was invited to have this conversation about cartography. Now, as you've heard in the previous uh, conversations, cartography, map making can be a very violent process. And Kenya is an excellent example of how the process of making maps can be an act of violence. It's important to know that the country known as Kenya comes to birth in 1897. Before that, we're our ethnic groups. I am a particular ethnic group. My Parents maybe might be from different ethnic groups, so I belong, you belong to your father. And with the ethne, with the ethnic identity, comes a set of presumptions, comes a history, comes a culture, comes an orientation, comes an identity that's based on things that might not make sense in the modern, in the digital age. So in 1897, the British show up as they want to do. The Portuguese have been and gone, uh, the Omani, Sultanate has been and gone, and the British show up in the East African coastline and think, this Uganda place seems very cool, lots of bananas, the weather is great, we like it, we're gonna take it. We're gonna negotiate a couple of treaties, swindle a couple of people, and we're gonna take it. Small problem, Uganda is in the hinterland, and there is hundreds of kilometers between Uganda and the, and the coastline, and the East African coastline. How are you gonna get all those bananas and other things out of Uganda? So actually the process of colonizing Kenya was incidental to the process of colonizing Uganda. The whole idea was so that the British could have a secure way of getting resources out of Uganda. And so in 1897, the protectorate is declared and begins the process of building this railway, which is in itself a process of cartography. Even if you look at Kenya today, if you imagine Kenya as a square, along the equator, and the equator runs along the lower third of the square, and the railway line goes from Mombasa, which is the second largest city on the coastline, to Kisumu, which is the third largest uh, city in the country, every major town in Kenya lies along that railway line. In fact, 91% of the country's population lives below the equator we have oriented our population around the railway. In Kiswahili, we say watu Reli, the people who live along the railway line, which is most of the country. Meanwhile, if you go to the top two thirds of the country, they ask you, how is Kenya? 
because of the systematic process of denying of resources and the idea of tacking on this geography onto another space that performs a different political function. This process of violence, of reorientation, of reordering the country continues into the colonial process and then through the concept of identity. We are now a new country and it's known as the Protectorate of Kenya. But the individual ethnic groups that existed therein don't necessarily want to do this voluntarily, and so they resist. And between 1897 and 1919, there's a continuous process of resistance and violence, resistance and violence, 24 to 30 armed resistances every year. What changed in 1919? What changed in 1919 is that the British built the first formal centralized identity system in the country. Every, the Native Registration Act said that every black person, every black male in Kenya over the age of 16 had to have their biometrics, their fingerprints collected, and their identity recorded in a centralized register. And if you were caught as a man outside the place where you were designated by your ethnic group, where you were supposed to be, where your identity was fixed, you could be arrested, tortured, disappeared, separated from your family. So the resistance that had been, say we're sending a group of our young warriors to go and fight the British who are invading our physical land, now became a cross-territorial process. You could not live as a black person in the protectorate of Kenya without fear of violence. And this is what began the process of effective colonization in Kenya. And so the violence of taking that identity that had hitherto been fluid, you could marry someone in another culture and take on that culture. You could migrate, you could move your entire village, your entire identity and situated in a different geography suddenly became tied to the idea of sedentariness. Your place as a black African is this area that we have designated for the Kikuyu, for the Meru, for the Luya, for the Luo. And moreover, those identities are constructed along the lines that the colonial administration has invented. And so, for example, 1948, we have the first census and the territory that is known as Kenya. In the center of Kenya, we have Mount Kenya, which is the second largest, second highest mountain in Africa. And so we call the ethnic groups that are based around that region, the Mount Kenya groups. One of the Mount Kenya groups is the Embu, and another one is the Kikuyu. In 1948, the census counted these two small villages, the Ndiu and the Gishugu, as Embu, because they were living in the territory that the cartographers had designated as Embu. But between 1948 and 1962, the colonial administration moved the boundary over Kirinyaga, and then Ndiyu and Gishugu, who the British had found there, minding their own business, were suddenly Kikuyu, and the Embu population decreased by 30%. These are some of the experiments in cartography and the violences that they it created in the territory that is today known as Kenya. And in some of the work that I've been doing, I've been trying to trace a genealogy that connects the contemporary challenges that we're facing with identity and belonging in the digital age with this particular experience. The idea of biometrics and fingerprints. Can you believe that fingerprints have been collected in Kenya since 1919? The ID card is the physical manifestation of this. This was literally a card. Uh, a piece of, some, it was a metal plate in some regions. And again, as I said, if you're a black man, you had to carry that with you at all times. And any white person who found you in the wrong place, quote unquote, at the wrong time, had the authority to punish you and turn you into conscripted labor. And that is what makes the colonial process effective. Everybody is a source of labor. So here you have this thing that has your fingerprints and your ethnic identity and your history and you're wearing it around your neck. In fact, the Kikuyu in Kenya, the word they use for that kipande is uh, cowbell, because that's the level of degradation and humiliation that is attached to it. What is the genealogy that connects that to what happened in February of this year? 
In February of this year, the government of Kenya announced that every single person within the territory of Kenya over the age of six had to go to their local chief's camp, which is the chief itself is a colonial construction, and hand over their biometrics and their GPS location, where they live, your connect so that they could connect your biometrics to your ID uh, card, to your tax number, to your health insurance number, to everything, a single source of truth identity. And we were given 30 days to do that. And if you did not do it, the government said you would be denied critical services. You would be denied access to your passport. You would be denied access to a new passport, access to healthcare, access to anything. What is the genealogy that connects this particular practice to the practice of the Native Registration Act? This is some of the tools that cartography allows me to think about. Because for me, as I said, cartography is a projection of power. And what this government is doing by saying that they're trying to collect this data is also continuing this tradition of projecting power onto the citizen. And identity is one manifestation of this projection of power. Because the Huduma number, this project that they're carrying out, not only tells you who you are, it tells you what you're entitled to. It defines your relationship to your government. It turns you into a source of maybe not conscripted labor, but suddenly, certainly terrified labor. Because we had to scramble 30 days for a country, the population of 47 million, not counting foreign citizens, because everybody had to do it. You had to go find an embassy. You had to go find uh, anywhere and get this done. To me, the process of defining Kenya, of drawing the lines that have defined Kenya, cannot be separated from the history of violence. And again, this is kind of where, what I want us to think, what I want you to think with me. And I'm going to go into a little bit of detail on some of these issues right now. I think we flatten out the idea of map making as, well, not we in this room, because obviously this whole conference has been about problematizing map making. But I think a lot of people present map making and identity building as a neutral tool in order to avoid the complicated conversations, you know, the pyramid that you were talking about, in order to avoid the discomfort of where they are situated in relation to power. What map making has done for me as I'm thinking through the digital is it's given me, or the idea of cartography, has given me the tools to resituate the individual and how the digital adds to this power discrepancy between the state and the citizen. So one thing is, what is the digital telling me about who I am? And how is that different from what went before? The title of my book is Digital Democracy, Analog Politics, because it's about the collision between the digital and the analog. And in terms of identity, this has become incredibly clear. Because as I mentioned, this Huduma number project, this projection of power, is tied to the idea of the ethnic identity as the central identity of the Kenyan. Your Kipande card didn't just have your fingerprints on it and your PO box address, or can be found on Kenyatta Avenue Street, you know, house number 22. It said that you are of this ethnic group from this village. This is your father's name. This is your grandfather's name. It was a patriarchal system that defined your identity by the men that you were related to and the physical location where your ethnic group was, quote unquote, supposed to be. We haven't broken this tradition. Today, if I see a Kenyan ID card because I'm required, well, I'll take a step back. I had to wait four years to get my ID card because my family is from the border with Uganda. And one thing about that border with Uganda, in 1978, it jumped this way and then it jumped back the other way because that's how borders work. They are an invention. So because of that jump back and forth, people from where I come from, our loyalty to Kenya is perpetually questioned, even though we're not the ones who moved the map. So we have to prove our Kenyanness. We have to be vetted before we're given ID cards. I was born and raised in Nairobi. My mother was born and raised in Nairobi. My grandfather worked on the railway. He was one of the people who had to carry the kipande. 
And yet here was this chief in the city of Nairobi telling me that I was not Nairobian enough, even though I, my family had lived in Nairobi longer than his. Because your ID card is not about me and where I live and what I do. It's about what my father does and where he's from because it connects him to that database, that registry that was created in 1919. It's about not breaking that genealogy. And so if I get a Kenyan ID card and I pick one up, I can tell a person's ethnicity because it goes right down to the location village, but based on what that person's father and grandfather and great-grandfather had reported in 1919 might sound a little bit benign, right? So, I mean, your ethnic identity is part of who you are. Except, ethnicity has been a core part of every single major political crisis in Kenya. Remember that imaginary geography with the line that connects the coasts? When we had the big post-election violence in 2007, the line between Mombasa and Kisumu was broken by a spate of some of the worst violence that the country has ever endured. You could not get from one end of the country to another. And one thing that was happening is that buses were getting stopped. Show me your ID card. And you are the wrong ethnicity, at the wrong place, at the wrong time, and you die. These are some of the violences that have come from the way in which the ethnic, the ethne, the ethnic identity has become indelibly linked to the idea of existing as a Kenyan citizen. And yet this is not organic to what the country is. This is connected to the power of subjugation, to the point of subjugation. It might seem a little bit abstract, but think about it this way. 51% of Kenya's population is female, more than half. If I marry a man from a different ethnic group, I lose my ethnic identity. My children are his, from his side of the family. So why is it that something that can be so transient and malleable in one half of the country, more than half of the country, suddenly becomes fixed and worth dying for in the other half? The process of constructing and reinforcing and, re re and reinvigorating this identity as a proxy, as an entryway to entitlement, as an entryway to citizenship, is an act of violence. And what the digital has done in Kenya, and especially in the last five years, is it's exacerbated this idea. Because what, again, what is transient, what is fluid, has to become fixed so it can be recorded and so it can be made permanent in a database that continues the genealogy that was started in 1919. Who does the digital say I am? Who does the Huduma number say I am? Not only am I my ethnic identity, but now my ethnic identity is fixed to my biometrics. It's fixed to the idea that I belong in a specific place at all times. And any kind of change in that is a form of disruption to what the digital is supposed to accomplish. And by the way, under this Huduma number law, if you fail to register a birth, you get a fine of $10,000. If you fail to register a death, you get a fine of $20,000. And yet we have ethnic groups like mine who have that disputed. I mean, honestly, to be honest, in the big scheme of Kenyan injustices, four years for an ID card, I got it in the end. My Somali friends never got theirs. And this ties into the next point that I'm gonna make about borders and belonging. The fiction of Kenya, you have groups like the Somali, for example, or the Nubians. The Nubians were brought over again by the British to fight on the British side against the local African insurgents, the local African resistance to colonization. And the promise was that if you fight for us, we will give you land from South Sudan. If you fight for us, we will give you land and we'll make you Kenyan. Today, four generations later, Nubians cannot get Kenyan ID cards, cannot get Kenyan passports, are not allowed. A, a, a friend of mine is a Nubian and she made a presentation and the other day and she said it in a very powerful way. My father was born in Nairobi. His father was born in Nairobi. His father before him was born in Nairobi. But my father did not have permission to die because he could not get Kenyan identity because of the way in which the ID card was structured. And because he didn't have an ID card, 
he could not get a death certificate. He did not have permission to die in Kenya. These are the structures that the digital has exacerbated through this violence. This, the, point I wanted to, the second point I wanted to make is about borders and belonging, and this ties to the Somali identity. The Somalis are on paper the sixth largest ethnic group in Kenya. But if you look at a map of East Africa, the Somalis spread all across the, what we know as the Horn of Africa. It's the longest coastline on continental Africa. Somalis are very present in uh, Ethiopia as well, Djibouti, Somaliland, Somalia. Now this is another place where, again, we go back to the colonial era. Because that two thirds of the country that is in the north is predominantly Somali. And the Northern Frontier District, that's what the British colonial government was never called it, was never effectively colonized. I said, you know, just don't fight us. Just be in the arid areas, mind your own business, and we will mind our own business and we won't fight. But people did resist. How the British chose to manage the Somali issue and the border issue is a challenge that we're still facing today because the Northern Frontier District was left pretty much to its own devices. And Somalis are pastoralists. When it rains on one side, you go where the rain is. When it stops raining, you go to the, another place where the rain is and you graze your cattle. Because of the porosity of that border, which has also moved back and forth a couple of times, Somali identity and loyalty to Kenya has always been questioned. And what the digital has done now is it has tried to create a sedentary population from a population that didn't even want to be part of Kenya in the first place. If you look at the current Somali flag that has five points, a star with five points, each of those points represents a geographical territory that is predominantly Somali. And the idea has always been that one day, what was this grand concept of a nation would be united. And that was what they were resisting, being co-opted into the story of Kenya when they didn't even want to be part of it. And they were punished by systematic denial of resources, a systematic denial of access to the central idea of the Kenyan citizen. What the border has done, and this, the border technology of biometrics and surveillance, is it has said that there is a line in the sand that families that are split between these two quote-unquote countries are now citizens of different countries and must ask for permission in order to access routes, trade routes that they've been using since before Kenya existed, since before the notion of Somali existed. Layered onto this is the contemporary war on terror and the terror group known as Al-Shabaab, which is predominantly Somali. The projection of the American border onto Kenyan territory means that if I want to fly to Mogadishu, I have to get my bags searched four times. I have to give my biometrics at the airport in Kenya and at the airport in Mogadishu. And that sounds terrible. It's a one hour flight. It's unpleasant. But on the way back, I have to stop in Wajir, halfway between Nairobi and Mogadishu, get off the plane, take all my bags out, have my bags searched again, go back, check in again, fly to Nairobi again. Why? Because the American border that has been projected as a result of the war on terror means that everybody who leaves Somalia is a suspect until proven otherwise. The, extra the digital has exacerbated this extraterritoriality of borders and identities and the idea that we have to keep reaffirming our goodness and our worthiness. The idea that the state can randomly ask anybody, even if you're not actually going to that country, if you're not actually entering that territory to prove who you are at any one time. Now we take our bo the border with us. A policeman can stop you on the street and ask you to verify who you are and you don't have, you don't have any, almost any recourse to that. And as a, especially as a black person moving in Europe, I feel this very keenly. I was flying to Tunisia a couple of weeks ago, and I transited through Paris. We didn't even get to leave the jetway. I stood at the end of the jetway, and a Parisian immigration officer stopped me and said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Tunisia. Can I see your passport? I hand over my passport. Who's paying for your trip to Tunisia? I said, on what basis are you asking me that question? I'm not going to France. 
why do you get to ask me that question? I'm, I'm literally, it's a one and a half hour transit. I'm going to my next flight. So those are the rules. You have to prove that you're worthy to enter French territory so that you can pass through French territory. And this has been the practice for African travelers transiting through Europe for the better part of the last five years. We take European borders with us. We take American borders with us. And the digital makes this possible because of the ways in which people, with her little computer, with her little iPad, she can check that I had boarded in Nairobi and that the gate agent in Nairobi had checked my identity and my passport and my return ticket before she can allow me to transit through Charles de Gaulle. The modern experience of extraterritoriality of borders is rendered more violent by the digital, and especially on people who had already historically been excluded from the power dynamics, from the idea of a citizen. The last thing I want to talk about is data and the datafication of people. When this Huduma case was announced, the Nubian community in Kenya took the government to court. And they said exactly what I just said. We've never been given IDs. We've never been given passports. We've never been part of this Kenya. And now you've come up with a new way of excluding us, and excluding us so thoroughly because we cannot be connected to that register that was created in 1919. And they, in the courtroom, the cabinet secretary for ICT was asked by a lawyer, why are you doing this? What's, what's the point of all of this? He said, unashamedly, data is the new oil. When your government starts to think about you as a resource and not as a citizen, as a person who provides something to the state, but not as a person who deserves to get something from the state, this can be a very disconcerting experience. And this is the challenge that we as digital rights activists are facing in Kenya, and the, the, I've seen in the developing world. Because we have all of these narratives, again, that are being constructed in the West that are telling us that data is the new oil, and data is great, and if you give us more data, we'll do better healthcare, and if you give us more data, we'll do better insurance, da 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 da, da. But you see, you're speaking from an, a geography whereby you already had some sense of citizenship relative to your state. You can sue. You, can, you have First Amendment protections. You have some kind of base structure along which you can demand to be seen as a citizen. What does this experience look like for people who didn't even have that? Being quantified, being flattened into your fingerprints, into your iris scan, into the state, your state of health, into the places that you go to, the places that you travel to, into how you move in your own geography and in the region. I actively resist this in my presentations. I use the word citizen deliberately because I want to bring this back into the conversation. Fundamentally, I think the datafication of citizens has distorted not just our psychic selves and our sense of orientation relative to the state, but also our physical self. What's the most important thing about me relative to my government today? It is my fingerprints. It is my iris scan. It is the photograph of who I am. It is not who I love. It is not where I dance. It's not what I eat. It's not my hunger. It's not my frustration. It's not my joys. It is, I, we are being reduced and distorted by the idea that our data is the most valuable thing about us. I'm being told to stop, and I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> But what I really want you to think about, ultimately, I, go back, I always go back to basics. Power. What does the digital make possible? What power dynamics does it enhance? What power dynamics does it distrust? I'm not a Luddite. I don't hate tech. I am mildly obsessed with Twitter. Um, I have a smartphone, even though I resisted it for many years. My, my boss told me I had to get one. Um, I think what the digital has done in many places is incredibly powerful. It's allowed us to claim space, for example, those of us who the state would rather not see, 
to tell stories about ourselves and to insert ourselves into the dialogue that we would not have been able to do otherwise. My granddad had to carry that Kipande Pass and had to prove his Kenyanness on demand at any one time. I get to lead a resistance and to be part of a resistance to this datification of the citizen. I get to tweet and to write and to speak up in a way that my grandfather would probably have loved to be able to do, to push back against the humiliation. So the digital is not just about throwing out the baby with the bathwater. My job is to complicate conversations and to give people the tools to think more critically about what it is that we are turning ourselves into or we're handing over to the states and what kind of power dynamic we're establishing or engendering. And so that's what I would love to leave you with. As you think about, as you think about maps and map making and orientations, what power dynamics underlie the way in which we construct relationships and the relationships between people and institutions and places? Thank you. So hi, everyone. Um, starting out with uh, probably uh, the most generic title for, you know, for a place like this, the ine inevitability of technology. Um, and by now, after we've gone through so much of this, um, it, uh, it seems natural. Uh, for a long time, um, people might have resisted technologies and, and so forth. Uh, but now it just seems, I'm saying the obvious. Um, but even though I'm saying what we've reached, there's, there are more details. The more we know about technology, the more we realize how inescapable it is. Um, my background related to a lot of um, journalism and political analysis and um, you know, following the news on the ground and commenting about you know, whatever it is arms sales, uh, talking about uh, policies, economic uh, things. and um, But recently, I've been talking a lot about technology. And the reason that there is this shift there is that there's no longer a divide between uh, you know, the politics of politics and technology. It's all part of the same ecosystem where we, we think we have many hats, but we're the same people dealing with the uh, a world. And um, this is why it's, it's excellent to, to, to think of it as digital Earth, because it is a parallel world that we have to explore. So these days, I'm uh, working with um, Tactical Tech. It's an NGO based in Berlin. And um, it has a lot of uh, projects that deal with technology. It's been around for around 16 years and been talking about technology early on when that was sort of like a, a geek luxury to talk about it and talk about your privacy and security and so on. So some of the projects that we have uh, which relate to how we deal with this digital earth is you have like a data detox kit. Well, what do you do with all the privacy information that um, controls your life? You know, and what do you do with... Um, um, how, how the data that you have and how it's being brokered and how it's being you know, used around affects elections. This is our data ourselves. So I have a lot of information about um, uh, elections. And uh, we have this um, really interesting uh, space that comments on tech. It's called the Glassroom. And there are a lot of um, objects there that are commentary on you know, the, the realities and the awareness of, of what's there. Um, in, in the digital world that we can think about critically. Um, my own project is, um, is called Exposing the Invisible, which is sort of uh, somehow what I've been trying to do ever since I was uh, politically engaged anyway. Um, and um, when, I was, um, when I was on the ground, I would um, follow the news. I would uh, try and follow people on Twitter, understand what are the updates, what's happening on the ground, and so forth. And, as uh, things went along, I, I realized that you know there's there's more that I can do even from behind a desk with all this information that we have out there. So um, I'll get back to the the, the program, but um, that I'm part of, and I'll present something uh, re related to that. But uh, there are two basic questions that we we think about when we're engaging with technologies. Like, how does technology impact things I care about? That's the huge part of of like our exploration, um, and then what can I do about it? 
all of the projects that we're, we're thinking about is revolves primarily around these two fundamental questions. Um, so the metaphor that I use is technology is like an iceberg. Um, and really what we're trying to do is we're hoping we're, we're not the Titanic at this, at, at this point. Um, because there's so, so much about the technology that is inescapable. And what we see, this fancy connection to the internet, is at the surface level. But beneath that is a set of decisions, policies, power, money, that all makes this possible and our lives are somehow affected. Uh, they're affected a lot more with what's beneath the surface than what we see. Um, but the premise here is that if people, uh, you know, if people have knowledge and tools you know, and critical skills, they can actually make decisions that affect their lives. It's taking that one turn before you, you hit the iceberg is one, one of the things. Um, if you'll notice, the problem is not just that technology is inevitable, it's that it's invisible. Um, these are images you can see here from Toronto, uh, Vancouver, and New York, and they are old images. And what we see in the, <laughs> in the cities is that the wiring is so obvious and is so there. They've just built it. We're going to wire. We're going to deliver technology. It makes things easier. Um, but what has happened as we go along? Wires are disappearing. And really, what that, is, what, what that is a metaphor for is that we're trying to hide the inner workings of, um, of technology. So maybe it looks better, but then also our ideas about it are so different. And now this is why <laughs> technology is almost indistinguishable from magic. Um, it, they both do the same thing, like, like doing something extraordinary while being invisible or hidden. Um, and I don't think that we can really try and, and, and escape that because somehow this technology is being used to track us and it's important for society to try and see that. And a story that I recently heard about and comes to mind is, um, uh, is a movement that started in the 70s called MOVE. It was African American, it was in the US, in Philadelphia, and um, they started trying to be you know, they denounced technology, medicine, so forth, and they were more uh, into animal rights and treating nature equally and on that equal footing uh, sort of, in a sort of way. And what happened is they had two major, major incidents and when an altercation with a, uh, with a police, uh, one police officer was, uh, was killed. That was in uh, 1979. But then in uh, 1985, the group was, um, you know, experienced the vengeance of not, of trying to strip themselves away from this kind of uh, system. And they were holed up in, uh, in one of the neighborhoods in uh, uh, West Philly. Uh, and the police um, used a helicopter to bomb their house and an entire civilian neighborhood. And they left them to burn, and those leaving the house were shot. Um, the place burned for multiple hours, and um, you know maybe only two of this movement survived, uh, and th they were they were gone. And the rea and actually they investigated this whole thing, but no one was held accountable. And so I'm not saying anything as dramatic as that, like you know one trying to escape technology, but I'm saying that. It is part of our system, and, uh, and escaping it will be extremely difficult, so we have to take some kind of ownership. Um, so how do, we, how do we engage if we have to engage um, with something like this? Um, and let's start with this idea of you know, maps, um, cartography. We're talking about this. And um, the interesting thing about uh, the maps, I, I would say, is um, they're I feel that the digital world has become uh, less so a paper map and more so like the matrix. Uh, 
It's uh, a lot of code that's flying around that is a potential map. But in a sense, in a sense that we can't see, it, it already is a map. We can see, um, it, we can transform it into a map. Uh, there was a great definition of uh, kind of maps that we see are trying to curate complexities. And I like that, that's, that's exactly what we're trying to do. And here's, a, here's an example of a project that uh, was shown uh, in the classroom from a group called um, Critical Engineering. Uh, what this is, is a map of our devices. These are the emissions that we have. I mean, this is not live, this is a recording. But they set up antennas where they would uh, pick up some of the, um, what, what your phone would transmit and would create this map. Who are you? Are Google or Apple? And you're sending out all of this and this is your location within the space. And here you go, a reflection of a digital map that's constantly happening and that you, you, know, you might not know even exists, but this is the data that can, uh, can cause it to happen. Um, are we even aware that we're emitting these kind of, this kind of information? Um, I think a lot of, of times we don't know, but, uh, but it's there for the taking out there with just people s sniffing the air for uh, uh, frequencies. Um, another example here, in a more physical sense is a, is a um, project called Reconnaissance by Ingrid, Ingrid uh, Barrington, who's also showed is, uh, these, uh, what you see, these first two images, what you see on, on, on Google um, Maps, and the first one on the top is actually, um, uh, it's called Lilith Springs, and it's, it's got um, this information about, uh, you know, it's a, green area, but what it actually is, if you think about it, if you actually see it from a different perspective, it's the Google data servers. And from their, um, uh, from their own software, which they control, they have hidden it. And what you're seeing, you know, is just uh, what they want you to see. Sure, Google has uh, many layers of terrain and uh, roads and maps and so forth, but the reality is we don't know what we're, what we're seeing and there is still a dimension that we, of authorship that, that is missing from us. The second one is actually an, an airbase, it's a um, focal airbase and it's the same thing. But you know, the idea, it's not just these places. Um, Google doesn't cover a lot of conflict areas and uh, there is a um, US law that prohibits American companies from taking uh, aerial photography of Palestine. And so you could never find high resolution uh, imagery of that. And it's by law and it's controlled. We don't have an input. Um, but for example, some groups try to resist it. I don't want to make it seem completely uh, hopeless, but some groups resist that. So there's a, there's a group called uh, Public Lab that actually d helps with do-it-yourself aerial photography with using kites and cameras. And somehow you can just fly a, a kite over an area and get this aerial photography, which is primarily a military idea of looking at things from, from the top. But we can still use that. I mean, most, most ideas are start with a military um, motivation. Um, the other thing is, um, yeah, maybe, maybe I can actually kind of skip that one um, just to get to other things. But. Or maybe I can just show a little bit of it. Um, there's no sound, so wait. There's a, there's a project here. You'll see it come up right now where people have changed the Wi-Fi, have simulated Wi-Fis. And if you look here, what they've done is they've managed to trick Google Maps into thinking they're in a different area just by sending it the wrong information. And so now we've given some kind of input that, uh, that changes uh, this kind of idea. I was, I was gonna play with audio, but um, it's fine. Um, I think we could go back to the presentation, but um, the idea here is that they've set up uh, a system where the information for the Wi-Fi uh, wi hotspots were were completely different from a different location. So people, when they went out, looked for cafes, 
you know, who knows how Google knows your exact location, right? You know, GPS. But a lot of the time, they rely on the Wi-Fi information. And so how can we trust that it's always telling us to do that? With this, with this kind of reliance on, on Google, we can manipulate it. Not enough to give us what we want, but we just don't know how, how, what we can trust. I'll get into um, uh, the hope here, right? Like, like I said before, is that if we have access to information and we have <laughs> informed uh, action, you know, choices and action, that we can somehow influence our own lives. That's the theory, that's, that's the main theory. Um, it's debatable at this moment in time, but that's the minimum that we have to start with. Um, here I'll go into the project that, uh, that we're working on. Um, you know, funny animations of me and uh, Laura who helps, uh, who, who runs this with me. And, uh, it's about exposing the invisible. And the main premise here is that there is a lot of information that's out there that can actually be used to uncover wrongdoing. Um, exposing that iceberg is exposing someone's corruption. It's there beneath the surface. It's, you can, uh, just like you can tell um, the idea, like just visiting a site when you see a Google map and just going there and to see, for example, shows you something. And then there might be this kind of chance that we have of creating some positive um, change. But let me, let me uh, go into like a kind of investigation that I have been recently doing, and it's kind of unfolding. First time I'm speaking about it. Um, um, yeah, I mean, here, obviously, uh, it's going to be about uh, Twitter. Okay? The idea now is Twitter has always said that it's a, it's a medium of free expression, and it's about speaking truth to power. Now, but really, what is, what is truth these days? It's getting harder and harder to, to know, right, with the abundance of information. So that requires a lot of digging. Um, and I think that at, at the present moment, even speaking truth to power is, you know, is not very useful. But Let's get, get into it. Uh, one of the uh, things that, like the descriptions that were, were uh, uh, in this program was called algorithmic regimes. And it sounds kind of like uh, ominous in, in a sense. And I like that because that's kind of uh, exactly what, what we're, it's not a future, we're, it's a future is here. We're living this kind of uh, being governed by algorithms completely. So um, as you can see, this is the Twitter bird being shot if trying to escape. <laughs> and mostly, Twitter, instead of free birds flying around, it's a cage. And how is that happening? Now, the idea that, I mean, I used Twitter, and it was very, very, um, such a cool way of kind of like exp experiencing uh, the Egyptian revolution or experiencing politics and fi finding things uh, on the ground as they happen. Uh, but uh, the reality of today is, um, kind of different. There have been a lot of complaints that have been happening around like, yeah, why is my account suspended? Why is, uh, why is this happening? I actually went into it and kind of looked a little bit. Uh, the story starts with, uh, as it always does, when one of my friends was suspended. He was a, uh, you know, an Egyptian graffiti artist uh, called Genzir. And one day, around the 30th September, 1st of October, he was suspended. Uh, off Twitter, and um, as I was thinking, why would they do that? And let's try and get into it. I realized it wasn't just him. What was happening is a mass suspension of people. Someone tweeted out, "Who else has been suspended for one day?" And what I collected was around 150 people. Um, when I looked into the 150 people. There are one side of a political spectrum. Of course, this can come from my own, uh, the bias of my feed. But I looked into it a little bit more. Is there anything, is there any explanation? Of course, there is no explanation, except a couple of days later, um, Twitter issued an apology and says, oh, we're sorry, we locked some people uh, out of Egypt um, during a routine uh, check. 
except it wasn't accurate. A lot of people were in the United States, were in other Arab countries, and the one thing they had in common was that one political you know, side. It also came at a time where um, there was a lot of movement on Twitter that could be translated to something on the ground. Um, this is very interesting. I probably will never get a, a real answer to that, except my observations. But as I was going through this, I found something a lot more systematic and a lot more dangerous that was happening. Um, a lot of people sending me in their stories have complained about being, not being reinstated, about being permanently suspended. Uh, and I realized it wasn't part of the mass suspension. There was something else that was going on. And after collecting a lot of um, evidence, I found that Twitter was misapplying its own rules. It was marking people for hateful conduct when they hadn't broken any rules. And when and when people would appeal, an automated system would respond. Um, what really happened is uh, I discovered that Twitter was applying hateful conduct to anyone who responds with a swear word in a response to a tweet in the Arabic language. The same wasn't happening in English. It was only happening in the Arabic language. And what's more, as I went through this, uh, I tried to, to I, I did an analysis of all the, you know, the names and stuff, and I did the, I used a very light swear word in response to uh, Twitter's account, and I was locked for 12 hours instantly. I appealed. I said, hey, guys, send someone who uh, reads Arabic. This is, uh, this is okay. I just called the, you guys hypocrites, you know, called a, an account of hypocrites. And immediately, like, not immediately, within an hour, I got a response that, no, we reviewed and we're sticking to our decision. Um, you know, of, co of course, I wouldn't, um, uh, I wouldn't let it go. I wouldn't let it go. I tried it. And here you go as a collage of all the people responding to Twitter, to, 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 to Twitter or to other people joking together, you know, <laughs> and saying, hey, um, you idiot, or so on, but you know, whatever, whatever the language they use, and they were suspended, and some eventually led to permanent suspension. Um, so I created, a, I actually created a, an account, another account. I didn't, want, I didn't want to lose my account. For some reason, I still held on to having that. You know, it served me through the years and so on. Um, so I created an account called Terry Bird, and um, you know, I actually, the most interesting finding is not even the swear words. What they did is they blocked things that sounded like the swear words, right? Uh, and to just give a, an English-speaking uh, audience an idea of it, if you say, what the fox, they would block fox. If you say, shut the front door, front door would be targeted. So I tested that. I created Terry Bird, and eventually, I wrote a word that it sounds very close to a light swear word that people who don't swear use, right? So about hypocrite. But here's the final result, and people who speak Arabic will re recognize. Now, Mr. Nabil, you're constantly exposed, and that's the word that sounds like it, to danger. It's important that you reveal the truth without putting anyone in danger, either this or present the story from your point of view. It's nonsensical, I know, but you know, somehow it's, it's still something. And immediately, it was um, gotten into permanent suspension. And no appeal can get me back on track with Twitter. Um, so, the, so the idea here, it's, it, we're, we're here, actually, right? I mean, we're at this uh, position where it's not going to, it's not, it's not the futuristic what happens when machines control um, your, your, you know, your, your life. It's, uh, there are consequences here. And the consequences here, we can disagree about what, you know, what's important and what's not. Um, but all the data that you built for them is gone. They've, they've, just put, they've just stopped giving you the data that you built. And a lot of this stuff is where you were at a certain time, 
the photos you 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 shared, um, your your story of uh, how you interacted with people, it's gone. And you, what you have to do is um, start from scratch, okay? And um, I'll borrow a little bit from James Bridle, who said, who's, who talks about algorithmic citizenship. But I feel that there's a platform citizenship, and you're a citizen of their platform now, and you. They can judge you. They can do whatever uh, you know they want. So I would say that right here, there is more to it than just Twitter. You know, apply, misapplying the rules. What, you, what Twitter has been doing is has been creating and, and amassing a map of influence that's theirs to decide. What happened is people were removed from it and. It's sort of enforced disappearance. And the thing is, when you are removed, your voice text, text, is, um, text is not a sound. Your screen, like the, your own text, your own voice is muted. And when you, when you disappear, you're still muted. Um, it sounds a little uh, dystopian. And um, it's not just happening in, in Egypt. There's uh, a lot of things that are happening right now in India. I haven't looked very deeply into it, but in India, there's this. This kind of suspension is happening. And um, actually, the most recent news, I don't know if, you, if you've been following, but uh, two people have been uh, charged in the US for spying on Twitter for the, for the Saudi government. So uh, there's like this kind of um, how do we know who's at the other end and who controls it? So some people that I know have also been uh, subject, subjected to uh, something called shadow banning. Um, I didn't know what that term really meant, uh, so I'll try and explain it. Maybe, uh, maybe others don't know it, but uh, it's a very interesting term, which means that if you send out a tweet, it appears on your timeline. It's not removed. It's not hidden from you, but no one else can see it. And um, I found that extremely terrifying. It, it's um, this oblivion to, to how you're being governed. Uh, it, they don't need to tell you. Um, and in a way, uh, it reminds me of a quote from Dostoevsky, who says, uh, the best way to keep a prisoner from escaping is to make sure he never knows he's in prison. And in a way, we are kind of uh, imprisoned in, in, that, in that manner. Um, the reactions of people have been really quite surprised. Even people who are away from the from the whole uh, Twitter uh, sphere. And some one of them here, this is very interesting. He's thought, you know, I I never got a, a so much as a warning, and I'm verified. It's like that stamp of Twitter means something. It doesn't. <laughs> they give you that stuff, and, and, and you think it's it's uh, it's something, but it it isn't. And then someone else wasn't return, you know, wasn't responded to. What can you do? It's kind of feels like helpless right now, right? Um, and I and I think that probably coming to to the end, um, I would say just. I'll leave this thoughts that this, that's with me. I, the program that I work with is called Exposing the Invisible. And there was this notion of if you expose it, then you've done something. But is it enough, really? I mean, today, I think, we've been so oblivious to what's happening that have we passed the point of no return about just exposing? Maybe there is something more that we can, uh, we can do. Um, but in any case, I mean, and this is like a much bigger topic, but what, what, what I come out with here is um, who are the authors of our digital maps? Sometimes we feel that we are. We are sometimes we are the authors. Um, but who controls them is more important. And um, what we're seeing right now is a digital earth with digital borders. And <laughs> really, the idea of eliminating the borders that we see that are written on maps, which are really oppressive, is quite, quite a great emancipating idea. But it's replaced by digital borders. And at face value, this opens up possibilities. But at the end, 
maybe they impose stricter rules. And what's really dangerous about the rules that they impose is that they're tailored to us. Is there, the, the citizenship that we have is just like targeted ads. We have our own, they have their own rules, and they can whisper to us what their decisions and what their judgments are. Um, and that is terrifying. You're doing it alone. You, 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 you digitally die alone, in, in a sense. Um, so, I mean, I think with just this small example of a Twitter investigation, it shows that, I mean, it wasn't that difficult investigating it. It just takes perseverance and a lot of time. And really, converting what you think and what you feel into some kind of actionable um, explanation of how you've been targeted, suspended, removed off a platform. Um, it takes a lot of work, but it's possible for us to, to have this ownership of understanding what's invisible about technology, even if we're not technologists, just by observing and making sure we do this black box uh, testing. We search from outside, try with different inputs, and we can gather some information. So I think maybe now I kind of, with this part particular example, I've answered the first question that we, we, we ask is like, how can technology affect us? Uh, the second question is trickier. What can I do about it? Is it enough within your own personalized digital border to you know, do something? Or is this something that needs to be done, needs to be done collectively? Um, I will leave it on this note. Thanks for listening. Hello, hello, hello. Yes, on. OK. So thanks very much. Um, there is, of course, um, a desire to connect these two um, talks. I think there's a lot that connect them. Um, of course, uh, the most obvious is that is a point I think you raised towards the end of your talk, Nanjala. And, as colonized subjects, we have always seen the relationship between technology and exclusion, mm. right? And I mean technology in a kind of more Rock. yeah, conventional sense, I would say. So for example, perfect example you had at the beginning, the train line that cut, right? From the first kind of idea of a kind of mass technology, of mass media, mm. the train immediately formed kind of a barrier, form of kind of type of exclusion. And then of course with Wa'il, what you're saying is, of course, within Arabic, in the Arabic language, there's forms of exclusion that don't exist in terms of um, uh, uh, what's going on with the kind of perception of Twitter as a platform in, let's say, uh, the world that was not colonized, the world that colonized, right? Um, and uh, I suppose... One of the, another clear example of this would be, or way to crystallize it, if it is not already crystallized through these two presentations, is of course the question of Palestine, right? Where, in which um, we know that a lot of these technologies that are developed, biometric specifically, uh, lie detectors, all kinds of things, are developed by uh, Israeli uh, companies um, that uh, uh, work toward primarily the forms of exclusion of Palestinian people. And Palestinians are, of course, the laboratory for those, th those technologies to circulate across the world, right? So it's not only, I would extend it, it's not only that we, as colonized subjects, we always saw the links between technology and exclusion, but we're actually the place through which that resonates out, right? Uh, and actually, forms of exclusion are the, the patterns through which uh, technologies actually develop. They're the engine of uh, technological ingenuity. So I just kind of like wanted to put that there for the two of you to kind of like expand upon in a way. <laughs> oh, out loud? Okay. <laughs> I, I'm really glad you brought that up because that is something that I wanted to talk about that I, I, I didn't talk about. And this idea of um, one of my favorite uh, 
thinkers, political theorists, Emmanuel Wallerstein, he just died uh, two months ago, and he came up with the idea of the world systems theory. And the core, he breaks up the world into a core and the periphery. And the core countries are basically countries that are in manufacturing, processing, service industry. And the periphery countries are basically designed to be seen as sources for raw materials. So to keep resources flowing into the core so that the core can become wealthier. And with the technology, with the conversation about digital technologies, you really see this core periphery dynamic starkly. You really see the idea that tech is something that is built in Silicon Valley, it's built in Berlin, it's built in London and whatever, to be consumed indiscriminately in other parts of the world. So uh, we're just laughing earlier because Jack Dorsey from Twitter is in Nigeria today. It's the first visit he's ever made to Africa, even though Twitter has been, for example, in Kenya, we've been using it since 2006. We used it to do election observation in 2013. We used it to do election observation in 2017. It's been the site for some of the worst political misinformation campaigns, hate speech, but also positive mobilizations, my dress, my choice. I mean, I literally wrote a whole book about it. And he is his first visit to Africa, and he refused to speak to the Nigerian press. He did a press conference in which he showed up for 10 minutes and said nothing and then left. And you really see this core, like technology is not developed with the periphery in mind. The periphery kind of consumes it, is, is supposed to consume it passively, but it's also supposed to be a laboratory for experimentation. It's also supposed to be the place where some of the um, ideas get refined before they get reapplied to the core. And this is what, like when we talk about Cambridge Analytica, this is what happened. You know, when I tell British audiences, American audiences, that Cambridge Analytica has been active in Kenya since 2011, has been active in India since 2011, has been active in Nigeria since 2015, has been active in South Africa since 2011. And all of the things, the misinformation campaigns that Western, British, and American audiences are freaking out about now were refined on African audiences, were refined on Indian audiences before being rolled out um, in, in, in quote unquote the core. And when you mention sort of Israel and Palestine, the, I don't know how many of you saw the story about the WhatsApp um, and a so hack whereby you would get a message on WhatsApp, a call, and you didn't have to take the call. But once the call was received on your WhatsApp, it would plant um, a spyware that would allow people to harvest information from you. Now, which countries are buying this uh, technology? And you look at, you run down the list of the countries, one of them is Rwanda. And Rwanda using it to um, harvest information because Rwandan opposition figures, this is being recorded, I have to be careful, um, have a tendency of showing up dead. Um, people who oppose the government mysteriously um, showing up um, dead in very strange circumstances. And Rwanda is one of the countries that has purchased this technology from Israel that has been piloted, tested um, on what we call periphery audiences. And so this is one of the dynamics about map making that I find really fascinating, cartographies of, of power that I find really fascinating is we, the periphery, have always been the experimented on. We have always been the place where, um, because the legislation is lax, because Kenya got its data protection law today, literally, after we have collected all of our biometrics and we've been threatened and we've been cajoled, Today, the president signed into law a data protection law. And because of this vacuum, this deliberate legal lacuna, we become the laboratory. And the difficulty of being the laboratory when you have been datafied and you've been flattened and commodified is, as a citizen, what is your recourse? What can I do to make Twitter accountable or to make Facebook accountable for a misinformation uh, campaign that leaves 37 Kenyans dead? What can I do... I try to problematize the space for the digital and politics in this way because I think people who build technology, you've connected it to the railway, and I think that's perfect because like the British didn't build that railway for Kenyans. They built it with an extractive purpose in mind. And we had to reorient the geography of the entire country around, and we still live with that reoriented um, geography. This is kind of what one of the experiences that we're having. And to finish off, I think the, uh, the, the, the element that of not being paid attention to can also have a positive aspect to it. When people don't know that you're using 
or don't care that you're using their apps, you can use your, their apps to plan a revolution. The problem comes in when the revolution succeeds and then they decide, oh, I want to start paying attention to what these people are doing. And this is why when, when uh, Jack announced that he's coming to Africa and he's going to these handful of countries, the reaction wasn't, yay, finally, it was, oh, crap. Mm -hmm. Because being able to fly under the radar as the periphery means gives you a space for agency that when you become a commercial opportunity, you necessarily lose. When you become a market, when you transition from being an afterthought to becoming a market, a target market, a growth opportunity, a new frontier economy, you lose space for agency because you, have to, you haven't made that transition to full citizenship. Yeah, and I wanted to extend it also in the sense that, um, you know, it's also who, how these things are perceived as engines of free speech and to who they're perceived as engines of free speech. And I think what you point to is exactly that they don't care if Arabs know that Twitter is censoring them. Yes. I mean, I can talk a lot more about how they don't care after yeah. I shared this finding with them. Um, they, I mean, to say they, they don't care is one thing, but uh, to say they can't be bothered mm -hmm. is, a, is more, probably more accurate. One of the things I, I didn't really talk about, but there was a screenshot of someone from Palestine whose all their media verified accounts were stopped at the same time. And as I saw this, I'd just done my, my <laughs> research. I was like, no hope. No reaching out to anyone. I reached out to a lot of organizations. I reached out to the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. I reached out to a lot of uh, people who were in a position to talk to Twitter. But this was policy now. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a mistake. And they were managing it. Um, th th that's the sense. And I mean, everything is PR, right? Like recently, Jack announced that he, he, Twitter won't engage in political ads. Yay, great. But they've shut down voices and created conversations and decide uh, many other things without the need of mm. political as they're building an influence uh, network in, in that sense. So, um, yeah, they, they, they have uh, denied the findings, even though they're re repeatable, reproducible and so on. And um, until they face some consequences, I feel they yeah. won't do anything. But I mean, Twitter here is not the issue. Mm. It, it's just this is a, a company that, that that says we support free speech. Other corporations are like we're not in the business of speaking free truth speech. to power. And Netflix mm. just did that yeah. um, with Hassan. With Hassan, 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 Hassan. Yeah. So yeah, I suppose. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to to ask. I mean, to develop. On, but I suppose one other thread that I found really interesting between the two presentations was this idea of some kind of fictions, right, that are being generated or that are being um, written. And I think in your presentation, the sense of fiction is also uh, very much, you know, related to the border itself as a kind of fiction. But also, you know, I mean, you mentioned the case in uh, Somalia, and that's also interesting in terms of how uh, the asylum system, let's say in Europe, has developed certain fictions around uh, those borders, right? So for example, the designation of safe and unsafe zones. Mm -hmm. So to say that you can return if you're an asylum seeker from the north of Somalia, yeah. but if you're from Mogadishu or coastal area of Somalia, you have the right to asylum, right? So they have a vested interest in proving through accent analysis, through other kind of digital technology, that people are from the north of Somalia and from safe zones, therefore denying them access to citizenship, uh, right to uh, migrate, all these kind of things. So my point is that there is always and continually in the genealogy that you show strategies to use technology to create borders that even exceed the national found, uh, borders, you know, and, and, and these same kind of uh, in, inner borders that you were speaking about in, yeah. in your work. So this kind of idea that, that and, and the continuation of that is, of course, that those people who go to do those asylum 
uh, interviews, etc., are actually forced to lie because the fictions that the bureaucracy produce of the ideal asylum seeker does not, in it fact, exists. exist sometimes. Or it exists somehow in a weird kind yeah. of parallel universe. So I wanted to just ask you about kind of fictions in a way. I love that you brought up that question because it touches on the other body of work that I, I tend to work on, which is refugees and migration. And the connection, the connecting thread really is, on one hand, when I'm doing the political analysis, I'm looking at the citizen that is located within a geography that is tied to a physical geography. But when you look at refugees and migration, you really see, as you the word that you've used, you really see how many of the things that we take for granted are convenient political fictions that we used to reassure ourselves about how the world works, but actually are really very tenuous. Um, the whole idea of worthiness and identity and um, citizenship and belonging being tied to worthiness has been so thoroughly applied to the refugee population. And now we almost have this creeping, um, it's seeping into other aspects of our lives. The first populations in Kenya that received the excesses of the digital um, biometrics, data collection, all that, were the refugees. Kenya uh, historically has the largest refugee camps in Africa. It's changed a little bit because, again, of the politics of America's extraterritorial borders. But um, we had, at one point, the Darb refugee camp had over half a million people. If they had allowed them to count it as a town, it would have been the third largest town in Kenya. But again, we talk about cartographies and fiction, Dadaab doesn't exist on the map. The town of Dadaab, the, the host city, you find it, but it's population 18,000. The half a million people or so don't exist on maps of Kenya, the half a million refugees. And so the biometric system that was rolled out by UNHCR to de determine who gets food, who doesn't get food, who gets um, access to services, who doesn't, is about worthiness. It's about filtering the refugee population from the, first it was about filtering the refugee population from the host community. Then it became about finding good refugees from bad refugees, people who were being double counted, people who had been defrauding the system. Then it became about people who had gone and come back because of this idea of safe zones, that if you were taken to a safe zone and you came back, then you were trying to defraud the system and we've got you. And what you see is the uniting principle in all of these things is these systems are not designed to include, they're designed to exclude. They're designed to find good people and provide them with services that they're entitled to, but primarily what they do is they exclude the vast majority of people because of the, the fiction of scarcity of resources. The idea of building a bi the Huduma number biometric system, the way the state justified it is, we're gonna provide you with services. The same language that UNHCR does with its biometrics. We're gonna provide you with the services that you are entitled to. But what it does is, what they're saying is, this, the Nubian population, the Somali population, people like myself from border communities who have always been excluded from identity structures, you're not worthy of these systems. So the first thing that they do is they exclude. In the most extreme version of this, the Adhar system that has just been rolled out in India, our Huduma number is based on the Adhar system. The Adhar system is based on biometrics. It's based on um, iris scans and all of that. You're a farmer, and you've been working the farm every day since you were seven years old, and you've been using a manual hoe to work the land. There's a pretty good chance that you don't have fingerprints. There's a pretty good chance that your fingerprints have been burnt off if you know, you're working in the house trying to lift a pot without oven mitts, because not everybody has oven mitts. In the few months after the Adhar system was rolled out, over 100,000 people committed suicide. Because a lot of it was, your registration is incorrect. Your information hasn't been logged properly. We can't find you in the system. But that means that I can't get the entitlements that I was supposed to get. We talk about China and the Uyghur problem. Again, this is being recorded. Don't put this on the stage, right? Um, <laughs> and we talk about how this biometric systems that are being rolled out, the biggest silence in um, uh, AI uh, sort of to do with biometrics and all of that is the lack of information on black faces. And there's uh, the, the Chinese government working 
with the Zimbabwean government to build a surveillance economy. Well, the Zimbabwean government today, uh, last week, fired every single doctor because the doctors went on strike. They're getting $75 a month in salary in an economy that has an inflation rate of over 600%. And so they went on strike. And now there are only three doctors officially employed by the Zimbabwean government. What does it mean when China then works with that same government to build a surveillance system that's built on their biometrics and is about bringing black faces into the system that has already been used against the minority population in China itself? Some of the complications around worthiness and belonging, if we start to look from the, to go back to the Wallerstein framework, if we start at the periphery, we can kind of see what's coming down the pipeline. We're not building systems to, to say, let's give everyone services better. The countries that have the best success rate with these um, digitized single source of truth biometric systems are the most ethnically homogenous societies. Estonia is able to build this amazing system because Estonia is like 1% Russian. 99% of people are from the same ethnic group. What that means is that they don't have that history of exclusion. They don't have that contested political history that is going to be exacerbated by a system premised on worthiness and exclusion. And these are some of the things that, as a political scientist, I wish that people who build tech would sit a little bit more in the discomfort of what it is that we're doing. We should have known as Kenyans, for example, based on the experience of the refugee population, what this Huduma number was doing. And I'll wrap up by saying, I was just on a panel with a person who's been studying the refugee biometric system, and he said something that I hadn't even realized. The refugee population, a lot of the South Sudanese people, had just gone through this worthiness exercise with UNHCR, and then the government of Kenya came and said, we're gonna go through a worthiness exercise with you in terms of registration for the Huduma number. And they said, wait, you mean I have to prove that I deserve services again? You mean I have to prove that I, I deserve protection again? Screw it, I'm gonna go home. And so a lot of refugees would have chose to go back to war zones and to have to endure the humiliation and the subjugation of having to prove that they are worthy, that they are human beings worthy of protection and inclusion one more time. Yeah. The shift of the burden of proof fall always on the person, and yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, I guess with um, well, where I saw that sort of same sense of the digital creating fictions that don't in fact exist in real life are, of course, the example you gave of the Google Maps uh, changing, erasing itself, but also, I mean, I guess interestingly, even in more kind of user-based networks, I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't have the same gravity, but for example, I know that Guns N' Roses now removed songs from their uh, Appetite for Destruction album from streaming services um, that, me, that they found today to be politically incorrect. Uh, of course, I don't really care, I never really listened to that album, but I mean, and, and you find other people who are quite masterfully kind of using the streaming as a kind of rewriting of history, there's a kind of reformatting of um, the historical record, right? Yeah. So, for example, Kanye West, his, if you listen to the first release of Life of Pablo, it's entirely different to the one you can now only access on iTunes. So, so it's actually quite interesting to think about maybe also some of the way that this could also be used uh, in terms of the way you were thinking about sort of shifting the location on Google Maps and these kind of things. Well, the the interesting thing here is people who can rewrite their history uh, have a lot of uh, power and resources, mm -hmm. and that's the key here. Um, this is the same thing with big corporations, but people who have the rights to their own data can do that as well. Mm -hmm. The problem is we don't have the rights to our own data. You know, like, uh, we trained all these social media platforms and kind of, I would say, arguably, the Arab Spring uh, made them kind of big and, and you know, something to go to. But, um, but we never owned this data. And that's the difference. I think it's possible to do this mm. in the case of like Guns N' Roses and Kanye West when you, when you do own some of the means to influence that because they own their data and they're streaming. Um, 
but with us, it's um, it's out there. And there's also like there are two things here, right? One one of it is like once it's out there, it's out there. I'll definitely find it, and that's one of the myths. But the other one is, uh, I mean, uh, the, like that's an important myth because the corporations mm. can erase it completely. Yeah. They can go after after things in copyright. They can go after um, all of your services. Well, and, you could still buy the tape of appetite for destruction. <laughs> you know, right. right. But yeah. There will always be traces, yeah. and this would be a job for exposing the invisible. And right. now the invisible is probably going to be the physical world. Wow. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> Nadia Christidi. Eager hand. It's uh, one behind you, and then you. Uh, thank you very much. My question is to Wad. Um, I found your formulation of like citizenship on these platforms to be very interesting and intriguing, because I'd never thought of my participation on like Facebook or Instagram as a form of citizenship. Sure. So I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit, and then maybe comment on besides exclusion and inclusion, what constitutes citizenship? What is digital citizenship? How is it maybe different from real life citizenship? And what's the relationship between the two? Like how is it maybe reformulating real life citizenship? Lots of questions, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's a, it's a complicated question, it's developing. And it, it will continue to develop based on uh, which platform it is. Uh, definitely the, the first, the first aspect of it is the rules that are set by the platform, which you subscribe to, and automatically gives you these services. Um, if, you, if you think about real life citizenship, what is, what is really happening? You're inhabiting a place and paying some of the dues in exchange for services. And that's not that much different to the online world. Uh, you, you, you're there, the promise of free service in exchange for your data, and following our rules. But the one primary difference is we don't have enough bodies, I mean, even theoretical bodies, uh, to have some oversight over this kind of uh, citizenship. Twitter tells you, uh, I'm going to decide on the rules. Facebook says, I'm going to decide on the rules. Uh, YouTube says, this is against my rules. You have signed up to this kind of voluntary citizenship, and you've paid a lot more than you have oversight. And I would say that is... One of the discrepancies here that takes away power. We can say what we want about our dysfunctional democratic systems that are, you know, uh, don't really deliver justice. But at least in theory, this idea of oversight is there. This idea of empowerment through uh, some third-party judge, you know, kind of uh, arbitrating between you and and whoever. So, I would imagine they're kind of similar, but we have less rights and. And the idea, and it's also really tailored to you. Like the set of rules are tailored to you, and actually, your la your language across the world. Like this is what happens is with an Arabic language, something happens mm. with your nationality, something happens. So, um, first, I want to thank Jamil Arts Center for allowing this conversation because usually we're being on the periphery we had to prove our worthiness to go to the court to listen to these kinds of conversations. <laughs> so I feel uh, lucky that I don't have to do that today. Yeah. I can just drive for 25 <laughs> minutes and do that without anyone seeing my ID or my passport or immigration or getting a visa to go yeah. anywhere. Um, I am a Lebanese Emirati. Mm -hmm. And um, it's very funny, it was, it was very funny listening to you talk about Africa, think about Lebanon and uh, what happened to Lebanon because of um, our tribes, mm -hmm. our sects that were used to define us as a country, mm -hmm. um, and the UAE that changed on the map cartography from the coast of pirates to the Trucial States mm -hmm. <laughs> to the Seven Emirates. And the only reason it was colonized by the, the, U the England is because they wanted a safe passage yeah. to India. Yeah. So exactly mm -hmm. what you're talking about. Uh, I guess my question to the three of you is, um, w okay, so <laughs> we know all this, um, but who are the core? Who are these people who are deciding on our citizenship, on our digital citizenship, or what we do, what do they do with our digital da data? And 
immigrants. If, you know, are there boardrooms? Where? Who are they deciding our fate? Because when you look at their politics, they're idiots. And what's <laughs> happening in, in, in England, what's happening with Brexit, and what's happening in the US with Trump. And if, if these are the people running these countries, who are the, the, the elders that are meeting these rooms and deciding yeah. on all, when you say they, but it, who it, are these people? Yeah, I mean, it's not, I suppose, when you think about how long these ideas have been entrenched, and I think that's what Angela really points to, they're, they're, it's, the, it's the historical time in which they've existed. They don't need constantly to meet in boardrooms because they exist. I mean, that's what I would say is that they're very much just part of a, of a ideological framework in which, let's say, half the world occupies yeah. uh, and considers another half of the world. So I think it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't need these kind of, this level of paranoia to understand how they, they, uh, they become implemented because I think they're quite intuitive. They've become to the point where they're intuitive. Yes, mm. and. Yes, and. Mm. That's an improvisation game. <laughs> um, yes, and. I think that what we have, building on that, a system that has an internal logic that makes certain demands. Um, someone brought this up yesterday, and I loved it so much. Um, the idea that a problem can exist without a solution, but a solution, no, a solution, yeah, a solution cannot exist without a problem, but a problem can exist without a solution. A lot of the ways in which we think about technology um, is finding problems that maybe aren't problems, but are problems that can be framed in a way that can be commercialized, that can be turned into a project, that can be turned into a nonprofit, that can be turned into something that makes us feel like we're doing something. And you see this a lot in the humanitarian space. I can say this because I used to work in the humanitarian space. If you're faced with a population that is starving, that is scared, that has lost everything, that doesn't know where they're going, is your bigger priority counting them? Or is your bigger priority feeding them and keeping them safe? How many resources are being diverted towards the datification of humanitarianism that should actually go into, hey, Maybe let's figure out how to get clean water to this population. Because I think, and I, I, this again goes back to what, um, what you were saying about how we like to feel like we're doing something. We like to feel like we're moving. And I think what has happened with the Silicon Valley sort of conversation is that movement um, has not been, has been oriented by the ideological demands of the economic and social system in which it, it, it exists, and not by the broader and more difficult to define ideas of what kind of society we want to build. What does humanity look like in an ideal world? We let a lot of tech companies and a lot of big corporations get away with platitudes. Do no evil, do no harm. We're the, uh, what is it called? The white hat uh, people. And we don't ask the uncomfortable questions of, well, what does that actually mean? What I try to tell, I do a lot of these talks, and what I try to tell people, especially in the tech space, is what is the intention behind the thing that you're building? Just because you can build it doesn't mean that you should. Just because, and especially because history is iterative, these questions about ID cards and exclusion, this is not something, I mean, I've given you the Kenyan example. We go to Germany. You know, people talk about the, the yellow star system that was given to Jewish people in Germany in 1939. That started in the 11th century. The idea that uh, Jewish populations had to be separated from the mainstream population by a physical identifier. That wasn't new. What's the contemporary manifestation of that? The idea that certain populations have to be separated from the rest of it. Exclusion is a human behavioral pattern. Okay, I'm building tech. How do I be aware of this? How do I see this problem coming and control for it before it gets there? I think these are some of the more uncomfortable things. And, and to me, broadly, in the big scheme of things, it comes back to more humanities, less STEM. I love science. I love clean water. I love all the cool gadgets and what have you that people build. But we need humanities. 
We need philosophers, we need political scientists, we need historians, we need social scientists, we need people who are thinking about people and the place of people in, in the landscape that we want to construct. <laughs> historians. <laughs> And this, um, yeah. I just want to say something about uh, solutions and problems. I actually disagree. I think mm -hmm. a lot of our problems come because people have solutions and they try and create the problems for it. Mm -hmm. And I think in a lot of cases, mm -hmm. power is about that. It's about um, writing down, sometimes it's about finding an enemy mm -hmm. that is needed politically. So mm -hmm. you have a, a, you know, a solution and then you create a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but. As for Twitter, Mina, they're based in Dubai, if you're thinking. <laughs> That's where the boardroom is. <laughs> That's where some of them are. Yeah. Uh, there was someone here. Here we don't need to. <laughs> Hi, th th thank you both. Um, I just appreciate very much the similarities between the two discussions, but I wanted to draw on something that I think is uh, starkly different, at least in my opinion, between the two cases, which hopefully also addresses partly the question that Nadia was asking about digital citizenship. And in a way, to me, the, the case of how the uh, ID system is implemented in Kenya and Twitter is a case of uh, how it, the technology is enforced. Um, th these, these are two very different technologies, which um, where the relationship between the monopoly that owns the technology and the users of the technology is very different. In Kenya, you've got 30 days and that's it. Yeah. Um, and I wonder how, whether this calls for different forms of resistance, because mm -hmm. I think you're talking about resistance quite a lot, but mm -hmm. um, I, I, I take your point about, you know, complaining with Twitter and then going to people yeah. around the world trying to figure out who can talk to Twitter since they don't listen to you. But, um, but I wonder whether we can elaborate a bit more on this idea of how do we resist yeah. with more social scientists, perhaps? Um, you know, the funny thing is actually, we were able to resist the Hujun Lumba, and we went to court, and people went to court, and people did a lot of public relations and uh, public awareness campaigns and everything, and the courts found in favor of suspending, so it's now not mandatory anymore, um, they can't deny you services, but it's still mm -hmm. limited to do so. And when you're talking about uh, Twitter, you know, Twitter, you don't have a court that you can sue them and say, you suspended my account um, unnecessarily. And this is, to me, the difference between private enterprise and, and, and this, because there's an established dynamic between the citizen and the state. I think we're still feeling out the contours of um, the dynamic between the citizen and the private corporation that is operating in a, sta in a space that is traditionally preserved for the state. Um, and I spent a lot of time in my book theorizing the digital public sphere in Kenya because of this. Because people have given social media especially um, a pseudo uh, public interest role that it doesn't necessarily want to serve. And we do that in Kenya because Twitter doesn't know what we're doing, doesn't care what we're doing, and we've been able to get away with it for many years because it's just Africa, it's fine. And now it's a potential market of hundreds of millions of people. And now suddenly what we're doing and we're mobilizing and organizing and the conversations we're having are slightly more important. And these questions of resistances are going to be, is it, is it a mass exodus? Is it millions of people saying, because the potency comes from the fact that they are you know, 2 billion Facebook accounts. Is the potency that we just mass delete our Facebook accounts and someone builds something new that's close to the vision that we have? Um, I will finish by saying um, one of the most striking things that happened two weeks ago. Ethiopia, population 110 million, has just come out of this process of 20, 30 years of authoritarianism and has had two years of violent, um, let's say, adjustment um, and then had a democratic transition. The Prime Minister won a Nobel Peace Prize. Last week, there was a, a young activist, organizer, whatever you want to label him, who mobilized a resistance to that prime, the week that he won, the, the week after he won the Nobel Peace Prize, ethnically incited violence. The interesting thing is, Facebook does most of its content moderation of Ethiopia in Amharic, which is the official language. This incitement, I haven't seen the, the, the posts in the original language, was being done in Oromo, for which Facebook does not have content moderation. And 67 people died. 
in the same week that Mark Zuckerberg was testifying in Congress about Libra, this new currency that Facebook wants to launch. The Ethiopia, the, the, you, uh, you've probably seen clips online of American Congress women, especially women, go, um, really giving him a hard time and really grilling him. But the thing that stood out for me sitting in my office in Nairobi was nobody asked any questions about Ethiopia. No, 67 people have just lost their lives. And there's a causal link that people can, that Ethiopian activists are establishing between the things that are being said on Facebook and the mobilization that's happening offline. And not a single person mentioned it. What does accountability look like when the company is American, registered in the United States, responsible to a US Congress, to US shareholders, operating in a space that is traditionally reserved for media and for public debate? And I don't have the answer to that, but this is, to me, one of those questions that we need to think about. Yeah. Resistance. Yes, that I, this is kind of uh, the most important question, isn't it? Um, how do we resist? We're we trying to find out, and obviously if we find out something that's horrifying, we try and resist, and the question here, what do I do about it? Uh, but I think the, the cases that we have here is uh, 1984 versus Brave New World. One is completely totalitarian and enforcing you, uh, to sign up for the system. And the other one is out of your own volition with the promise of individual freedom and expression. And I will, um, I will say that you resist with whatever means possible at your disposal, uh, uh, you know, to fight the right thing. It's not, there's no single cure. If you think about it, um, you go back even to, I've been wanting to talk about Fanon for a bit and uh, <laughs> Fanon has been advocating for violence, uh, in, you know, in the in the past because it what people were oppressed violently. But today, what we have in the digital world, it's targeted ads. Yeah. This is violent. <laughs> who do who do you fight really? It really is picking up whatever means you're being uh, oppressed by or suppressed by. And in that case, it's about ownership of your taking back ownership of your data, fighting for that, going through law uh, to to courts using whatever the, these tools are lying around, and we have to be creative because we don't have the resources. We have to be creative with what we have. So, and that's a bigger question, and not, no one answer to it. Okay, so we have time for one more question, but we have two questions. So we're gonna do them back to back. Can we do that? Sure. Mm -hmm. Quick. Okay, uh, this question is addressed to Nanjala. Hi. Um, I think one of the issues that maybe is not being talked about is that we're actually resisting against a master morality, which is absent in the minds and hearts of a lot of black and brown, uh, I would say, collective consciousness, right? But a master morality is not a monopoly of any given tribe or race. It's a phenomenological dynamic that can be employed by self-actualized individuals or collective. If we are going against also a preoccupation with racism and an effort to eliminate resentment, I think one way to do that is by adopting a ma master morality. So my question is, if you desire to create a map which represents all that is most meaningful to you and the Kenyan people, and you destroy the installed patriarchal hierarchy to do so, are you willing to replace that hierarchy with another hierarchy? And would that hierarchy be patriarchal or matriarchal in nature? Thank you. My question is built on the two previous questions, and it's really just pragmatic. There's all sorts of computer engineers graduating from wonderful schools across the world with the potential to make different Twitters and different Facebooks. And we know that you know the founder of Facebook was just a college dropout, for heaven's sakes. So we, from listening to you, it sounds like there's some sort of deterministic incapacity to say, well, we can do this differently. We can make new sites that are moral. We can make sites that allow for you know, left-wing politics to try to find justice in the world. Why are we not doing this? Why are our youth not doing this? That's my question. Okay. That's a great place to end. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't know. He's Just the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> He's the moderator. I'm 
um, like this also refers to this like uh, strategies of uh, fighting for and against something like and also the question of morality like do you consider lying or multiplying the problems or the multiplying the fake voices also as a strategy because I know cases which I am in sympathy with and they work so I would like to hear your thoughts about that as well okay um, well, I will take those in reverse because I think yours is a little bit easier. Um, I think one of the big fallacies about the way in which we use digital spaces for political conversations is that the avatars that we put online are who we are. And in, for some people, it's a closer approximation of who we are. And for some people, it's completely removed. It's, it's a persona that we adopt um, for specific reasons. And... I think when you think about it that way, the question of the morality of lying and manipulating information online, then you start to see why some of these things are complicated. I think if people are dependent on the information that's being generated on social media platforms especially for their political survival, there is a little bit of an obligation to truth. There's a little bit of an obligation to ensure that the conversation that we're curating online um, as best as possible represents the reality offline. And I say this because we've been through two cycles of really paid for manipulation information online. And what it has done, the consequences of it, is not even just in the immediate sense that someone paid for bots to distort this specific conversation, is the dis disconnection of people, the increased disconnection of, between people and truth and how people process political information, and how people are being socialized and conditioned to distrust so much political information. So that even a national newspaper putting an article on Twitter gets, you guys are lying. You guys are misrepresenting the truth. Some of that is good, because sometimes the, what the national newspaper is reporting reflects the interests of power, reflects the interests of the people who are at the top of the pyramid. It's good that the New York Times is asked to check its reporting of Kenya and it's, it's factu the factuality of that. But I really worry, I think underlying, for me from a philosophical perspective, underlying all of this room that we make for misinformation, misrepresentation, even if it's a good white hat bot campaign, is what is the relationship between the citizen and truth? And what is the implication what comes next? What comes next when so much of our political debate has been shifted onto platforms and we no longer even trust each other? I don't know if I've answered your question, but maybe we can talk about it afterwards. Um, if I had a chance to replace the structure, uh, would it be patriarchal or matriarchal? Like, what would it look like? I think that um, my ideal world is very horizontal. My ideal world is very inclusive. My ideal world is one in which the personhood, the humanity of all people comes first before profitability, before um, all of these other things that I think have trumped um, really important things. That is my politics. That is what I think infuse, to me that's what the gift of feminism is. The feminist, fe feminism is not just about the relationships between men and women. It's about interrogating power from the perspective of the person, of the group of people who have been traditionally excluded from power in many of the societies of the world, certainly not all. And so that to me would be the ideal world. And I think for me, the, the thing that I would, the place in which this replacing happens begins with an honest encounter with history. A lot of the things that I presented to you about Kenya today, most Kenyans don't know. And that's not an accident. It's about archiving. It's about museum practice. It's about whose story gets preserved, whose memories get elevated. And so for me, that's really in terms of an action thing that needs to happen is how do we get more people to have an honest encounter with their histories and why their privilege exists and why they have it? Are Europeans or British people, for example, prepared to have an honest conversation about why Britain is rich? There are only six countries in the world that have never been invaded by the UK, by the US, right? Are Americans prepared to have an honest conversation about why the US is rich? 
it's not because you're a little bit more creative than the rest of the world. And to finish off with the point about why aren't creative people, the people reason. are building this. The challenge is when an earlier, when, when a technology, the first version of the technology becomes, part, this is the fourth, this is social media 4.0. I have a genealogy that I have in the book about the different iteration. Who's old enough here to have had a Friendster account? Not me. MySpace. Who's old enough here to have had a MySpace account? AOL bought MySpace for $250 million because they thought it was going to be the most valuable company in the world. Who still uses their MySpace account? Right? There's no guarantee that the version of social media that exists today is still going to exist five years from now. 10 years from now. And so what we're trying to do, hopefully, is or at least what I'm trying to do, is to make sure that we have grasped the, in, the complexity and we are ready for version 5.0 and that we do better in version 5.0 than we did in version 4.0. Because version 4.0, the real focus was on commercialization. The reason why MySpace went the way that it did is because they couldn't figure out how to monetize it as effectively as we have figured out how to monetize Facebook and Twitter. Okay, fine, advertising, targeted ads. What's version 5.0 going to do differently about that? So maybe, maybe in five years, LinkedIn will be the new hot thing. I'd like to, I'd, I'd like yeah, to actually yeah, answer this uh, slightly <laughs> differently. Um, I think that there is no such, I mean, I made it seem that it's impossible to build uh, ethical systems through technology. And that is the reality. I don't think version 5.0 will, uh, uh, will differ because it is a, it's not a uh, technological question. It's not how good people who are building it, what decisions they make. It's about the structures. Mm. And it's about a community. This is how the whole uh, technological utopia turned into a, a dystopia, is really well-intentioned people who wanted to solve the world's problems using technology being co-opted into the structures where we have a s social media platforms are learning from authoritarians. It's not happening the other way around. Mm. Technology is learning from people mm. and it's reflecting it. And, and um, so it's impossible to have a conversation about ethical design or computing. We have to have you know, ethical being and ethical structures and ethical uh, approaches to life in order for that to be reflected in technology. We're going to argue about this later. <laughs> On that note, thank you so much, Wa'il Iskandar and Nanjala. Thank you so much. Thank you.